Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And forgive my voice. I have a little laryngitis today. So I'll shout. Um, I visited at UC San Diego several times before, and I can't decide whether it's really got the, the best piece of real estate. It's up there in terms of the best piece of real estate of all the UCs, but you have the best climate. There's no question about it. And it's always just a pleasure to come here. And today I had a really nice time meeting with some of my very favorite people, graduate students, who I don't uh, see as much any longer since I'm no, no longer graduate dean. Um, and I guess a lot of you are here, which is good. Uh, this is work that was started in, in uh, 2000 uh, when I first became the graduate dean at Berkeley. And I'm going to go over about 10 years of research. We've been funded by the Sloan Foundation and we've looked largely at the effect of career f um, family formation on the career lives of men and women PhDs. Although I've also looked at uh, women doctors and lawyers and MBAs in a secondary way. I have not done the original research myself. When I first became dean, I was so excited because for the first time in history, the number of graduate student women was 50.1% of the new entering class. And I thought, wow, you know, as a 70s old feminist, I never thought I'd see the day to see this equal participation. And as you can see, this has been the case uh, across the last part of the last third of the 20th century. This is a test. The winner of this test gets either, depending on your age and predilection, uh, Starbucks or bourbon. So, they've got to know. I could go either way, I tell you. Uh, so, the guy on the right hand side is a kind of a guy like figure, you got to admit. Shoulders and big head. And, uh, and then the woman on the left side, it looks like a female figure. So, you got lots of clues. This is the University of California, Berkeley. We have a male figure and a female figure. What is it? Try the heads first. That's the easiest one. 987 versus 325. Faculty, faculty. Yes. Tenure track faculty. Tenure track faculty. Not all faculty, but tenure track faculty. So you see the guys have big heads and there's little heads on the women. We have about, it's going up, it's about 26% women faculty. What is it at UCSD? Do you know? 17, oh, even better. <laughs> yes, because you have a medical school, so that, that changes the ratio a lot. Um, and, and it hasn't really changed much at all for the last 10 years either. It's really flattened out. It's not making progress. What about the neck? You see that women have rather stout necks compared with men there. That's in some ways the most important part of the story. Lecturers, adjunct faculty. Exactly, lecturers and adjunct faculty. Now, that is the fastest growing part of the academic world. Uh, as of about six years ago, more than half of all undergraduate classes were taught by lecturers and adjuncts. And I read a figure recently that the percentage at four-year universities and colleges, percentage of tenure track faculty had gone down from 58% to 37%. And it's really on the backs of women for the most part. And as you'll see, it's on the backs of married women with children quite often, more, more, than, more than not. And what about the rest of the figure? Staff. Pardon? Staff. Staff, God, you guys are so smart. Who said staff? Bourbon or Starbucks? Uh, bourbon. <laughs> you have to follow me to the airport. <laughs> It'll be worth it. <coughs> uh, that's staff. And like UCSD, if you did a count of the staff here, this is just out of the demographic figures they publish every year, you'd find that you have you know, about seven times more staff members than you have faculty, probably even larger than that, because you have a, a, a medical school and you have research laboratories, et cetera. And women are more likely to be in the administrative assistant, clerical, and food server roles, because we also, of course, have dormitories, as do you. Men are more likely to be in the higher paid um, management or technical roles. So this is the way that the University of California looks at Berkeley. I'm sure if you did a breakdown here, it would look quite similar at UCSD. In fact, it's what's, what is the way of the American workplace. Here we have a San Francisco law firm. Uh, men have very 217, it's not 21, it's 217 partners versus 51, uh, and then you have the net part-times and the associates. Uh, basically, women have entered into all these uh, male-dominated, high-prestige, high-paying professions but for the most part, they are more often stuck in the neck and, and fewer in the head than, than our men. 
Now, why is this, we wondered. Well, mm -hmm. in, when I um, took the job, I also inherited a really good research unit. And I had a Cracker Jack research team, um, and they could answer anything, really. So uh, we talked about it, and I said, I really want to know what's the effect, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to our graduate students, particularly the women. At this point, when they came in the door, they feel that they've been treated equally all through their lives, and they have the same ambitions, they think that nothing is going to stand in their way, and I'm hoping that's true. But what actually does occur later on in life? Now, of course, I, I, it was not a naive question, because I had done work, work family balance studies before, and I knew to some extent what I was uh, looking for. And we happen to have the best longitudinal employment database, which, how many of you are PhDs in this room? Okay, you're part of the study. When you get a PhD, you, you fill out the survey of earned doctorates once. And then a certain percentage, I think it's about 5%, are queried every two years by NSF, all disciplines, all PhDs uh, in the country. No matter where you go, if you go to, if you go to work to employment in a, a corporation, they'd also find you. And they do find you every two years until you are either 76 dead or have left the country. But you're only escaped from NSF. Are any of you part of that, that sample, that two-year sample? No, but you're lucky because they do, they do. But the, because of this, we have a richer database than any other employment area, and we're able to ask very pinpoint questions. And the question I wanted to ask first was, what is the effect of early babies on the chances of getting tenure? And an early baby, by my definition, is not so early. It's anything up to five years post-PhD. Now, as I was telling the graduate students, we're aging in place. Everyone is getting a bit older. PhD average is now at 34. First job at 35. Tenure pushing 40, 39 and, and a half. This is several years, three or four years, uh, older than it was even 15 years ago. But there are a number of factors <coughs> with it, including the fact that a lot of graduate students don't go directly through. They'll, they'll drop out and do something else. or But they're also just there longer because of the postdocs and other things. So we're talking about any time from birth, supposedly, uh, well, not from birth, for women probably 12 or 13 years old until they're about 28, 38 years old. That's five years post-PhD, 38, 39. So that's really pretty much the whole scope up to the tenure decision. And I think this picture tells it very well. You have the heads and the necks. And uh, women, 53% of the chance of getting, of achieving tenure as opposed to 77% of men. Uh, these are people who go into the academic world in any way. But their necks are much bigger uh, at second tier, part time, non tenure track faculty. Now, men, women who have late or no babies also don't do as well as men, uh, but they do a lot better than women who have babies. A late baby is anything, it's usually after 38 or 39, so there aren't too many babies as you will see during that period. But it doesn't have an effect because they probably already have tenure when they have that baby, if it's five years post PhD. Um, and their necks are large, but not as large as the guys. So here we have the heads and the necks, and these are women in science. And I just want to show you these are women in humanities and social science. There really isn't much different. I think what was startling to me in looking at the SDR, we think of disciplines as being very different, and they are, because the numbers are much smaller in the STEM fields. They're much larger, obviously, in sociology and English literature. But the pattern, the proportion of women uh, who, who achieve tenure within the numbers that there are is this, basically the same. The, the, the patterns of, of progression are the same in both fields. And then we looked at more carefully, and we tried to find out when, at which point women were, were dropping out and not getting tenure. And it's really not so much in the tenure decision itself it's before they even get that first job. So women with babies are 28% less likely than women without babies to enter a tenure track position. And married women are 21% less likely than single women to enter a tenure track position. That's usually the dual career problem, or the two-body problem, as we know it as. Um, and then they're 27% less likely to become an associate professor, that's get tenure. And then they hang on for, for a much longer time 20% less likely than men to become a full professor within a maximum of 16 years. So that's the place that they get stuck if they actually do get tenure. So uh, this pattern is 
is really quite consistent. You see another shot like this with it's just within the stem fields because it's actually more dramatic in the stem fields. Not much, but a little more dramatic. So this is again, this is over a period of several years of doing research of all kinds. Uh, so later in the game, we looked at what happens, what makes people drop out. So we started with all the graduate students, and I know there are some people in this room who actually took the <coughs> survey in 2007. Thank you again for your participation in the survey. Uh, and we, we surveyed all the doctoral students in the UC system, including UC San Diego. And we asked them a number of things, and these are just a few of the results. We asked them, um, what was your career goal at the start of the PhD? And you can see for both men and women, uh, only about half really wanted to be dark blue professors in research universities, like their professors. Although, as you know, all professors believe that they all want to be that way, and that's the only thing they ever train them for, is to be research professors. And then a good portion, the light blue, want to go into a four-year university, and the others want to go someplace else. But then during the course of their studies, this is a snapshot, so these were students who were second year and on, and the biggest change is within the second year, within the first year, actually. Uh, they change their minds, and you have a dropout of about, for men, about 10% who no longer want to be a, a research professor. And for women, it's a much larger dropout who don't want to be a, a research professor. And the four-year colleges pick up a bit, but mainly they just want to get out of Dodge and go to business, government, or whatever. So they're making those decisions pretty early in their career, because you're not even 30 years old at this time. And why are they deciding this? Well, part of it is, we ask them, what's, um, is it important to you, how important is it that your workplace be family friendly? And the majority, both men and women, found that as something that's very important to their choices. And the majority also found that research universities, like the one they're at, like UCSD, are not family friendly. They look around them and they just, just don't see it. And they think that the four-year college is going to be a lot more family friendly. That they have is the ideal. And after that, perhaps corporate life. But the worst is going to be research university. So they're looking for a family-friendly <coughs> research place. And those who um, actually have a child, this is women, active women in the sciences who have a child while they're a graduate student in the UC system. Not many do, about 10%, but some do. And as you can see, in this particular slide, more than half of men and about half of women started out wanting to be a research professor. And men dropped from, after having a child, men dropped from 59 to 45%, but women dropped from 46% to 11%. They almost truly give up on the idea <coughs> with the experience of childbirth. We have a paper that reports why graduate students reject the university, uh, the research career, that gets a lot, a lot of um, attention, and if you're interested in this topic, it's readily available, as I'll show you in a minute. Now here is, a question about why are you changing your point of view? And I should say that, I didn't put this on here, but the number one reason why both men and women are changing their point of view is they think it sucks to be a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't like the life. But in addition to that, they look on ahead, and work family issues are enormously important here, or work, work life balance more than anything else, other life interests. Uh, both men and women rate that very high as a reason for, for changing women even more strongly than men, and here we have issues related to children, a huge proportion of women, 46% compared with 21% of men. So you see both groups uh, not looking, looking toward work-life balance, but family issues still stronger with women. And then for men down here, you have monetary benefits and career advancement issues, 31 and 34% are higher than, than women. Uh, although, again, these are not just women's issues men also uh, show this kind of concern. Now here are some of the out of, your, out of the mouths of you. Um, I like the second one, the blue are the guys, of course. I like the second one particularly. Fed up with the narrow-mindedness of supposedly intelligent people who are largely workaholic and expect others to do so as well. And uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a fake a figure of truth there more than fake. Maybe. I look at the lives of the professors I see every day and I want to emulate none of them. <laughs> Those guys are disgusted. <coughs> and all the women, li literally all the women who, who left comments on this had something to do with family. I really want to be a mom. Seems like an extremely difficult goal to align with the goal of being a faculty member at a top university in engineering. And then the second one, since beginning my doctoral work, I've become convinced that very few, if any, 
female professors are able to have stable, fulfilling lives, the sort of wish for a stable marriage and family, and that academia is not very supportive of women, etc. Um, I think this is important because these things don't just happen because people have a bad time getting tenure. Much of the decision and the reason why women do drop out in larger numbers than men and fail to achieve tenure or, or uh, have success in the university starts with this attitude change at the beginning. They're just not going to go in that direction. And here were postdocs as well. These are actually UCB postdocs. We did a study of uh, all of the postdocs in the, the system, but this one is just for UCB. Of those who are married with children, and it's a pretty big number because they're older, now they're in the childbearing age. People don't really think about these issues too much until they're sort of pushing 30. And then when they're postdocs, they're usually well, well over 30. They're into their, deeply into their 30s. So we have a very high proportion who are married with children. So 59% of the mothers say that they are no longer going to continue in a research career in academia. Uh, fathers are going to shift too, but not anywhere near as much. And then you see the same phenomenon for women who are married without children, and to some extent, uh, single without children, but far less so. The married women without children often use, or often uh, remark that geography is the main issue because they are in a dual career. Women are more likely to marry um, PhDs than are men. And the single without children say, usually things like postdocs are usually in the lab sciences. I never get out of the lab. I never meet anyone. I can't stand this. I have no social life. So they consider it a confining life and want to leave as well. So overall, you see women wanting to shift away more as postdocs and women with children very much. And, oh, let's see. Nothing's living. No? Okay. So putting together many studies into just a, a, a few little high points from this uh, first few years of research. Overall, men with early babies are 38% more likely than women with early babies to achieve tenure. Women with early babies leave academia before obtaining their first tenure track job. Single mothers are more successful than married mothers. Now that, I, what do you think? I don't really know why that's the case. We just haven't investigated. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had that situation and um, you know, when you have a kid to take care of and a husband to take care of, and, and you got this big fat job, I mean, who's got to go? Someone's got to get it. <laughs> so, <laughs> got out. <laughs> so well put. <laughs> I have heard someone say, I have only one baby to take care of at home. <laughs> that kind. I also think the fact of mobility, the fact you don't have a, a two career family, is what makes a big difference. And maybe the fact that you have no choice, you just have to really work hard because that, that's, that's the job you have. By the way, if, you, if you'd like me to stop and, and answer something, please do. I don't want to just talk at you, so be sure and uh, come up with questions if you feel, feel obliged, I feel obliged, feel inclined. Uh, women with late babies do as well as women without children. These are the late babies, as I say, which are usually after 39. And having no babies at all is the dominant success mode for women, regrettably. Men who have early babies do very well. In fact, they do better than all others, including single men and women. Now that, I don't, I don't understand that either. Why would married women with children do better than single men? Someone to pick up and drive somebody. Okay, someone to take care of them. I think there's another issue as well, and this has come out in our studies in, in many different ways. If a woman has a baby, particularly a scientist, they are considered no longer serious. If a man has a child, they're considered more serious. As my father would say, my blessed departed father would say, marriage really straightens out a guy and kids make him super stiff. <laughs> That's where you get working stiff, I think. <laughs> Married with children. Um, a high percentage of mothers slide into the second tier, part-time adjunct and lecture core, the gypsy scholars of the university world. And this, is, as I mentioned, is the, is the growing employment sector. And for the most part, I don't know about UCSD, our lectures are not treated very well. I don't know about yours. I mean, they're now, they have a union. I think they have a union here, too. That's improved their conditions, their working conditions. But they may get, they don't even exist in the departments. They, get, they, don't come, they have no place. They're marginalized. They are always um, feeling very much on the periphery of things, even though they are 
many of them are very successful scholars in their own right and publishers, but they just get no attention. So in general, we make that second tier pretty miserable, and they get paid very, very little in academia. And yet, that seems to be our, our growing, and I guess that's the reason it is growing, it's cheap for the universities. Yeah. Did you look at it all, um, because we have the, the NACI system, LSOEs, LPSOEs, and how they may be faring? LSE is uh, security and employment. Not sure what security and security and employment, yeah, or potential. Well, I, they certainly fare better, better than those who don't have security and employment, who work from you know, season to season. But their salaries are still incredibly low. I think they get at least a very good $12,000 a course. So they have to work very hard even to make um, a living wage. And they're probably not making a living wage most of them. So it's still very, very low pay. But they do get benefits, and it's much better than it used to be. Then we decided, or I decided, I said, there's something missing here. We've been counting heads. We know how many uh, heads there are, men versus <coughs> women, et cetera. But what do their family configurations look like? For instance, if you're in the sociology department, if you have 25 men professors and 25 women professors, are their family configurations the same? Uh, that's a different measure of gender equity. Not do you only do you count professional excess, success, but familial success as well. Um, so we asked a different question. What is the effect of career on family formation? And here we found an even more startling gap that, and this is again from the SDR, so it's all fields, all tenure faculty, and married without children, men are 70% and women are 44%. And single without children, 26% women and only 11% men. So almost twice as, more than twice as many. Uh, the only group that's even similar is married without children. It's 19% versus 15%. And of course, you have many more single single mothers than you have men. That's a, a, a truly discouraging pie chart. And this is in the sciences, and very similar pattern. Actually, women are more likely to be married, and so are men in sciences. It's a marrying group, more so than the humanities and social sciences. I don't know. I have no explanation for that. <laughs> it might be that that the you know I mean, the odds are different in the sciences. So. Women are more likely to be married because they're just, they meet more men, maybe? <laughs> but they are more men and have more children. And then you have single, twice as much, more than twice as much as well. And uh, the only one absolutely the same is married without children, both men and women. Getting divorced. Oh, this, this gets a little sadder by the, by the slide, doesn't it? Uh, there you have the latter rank women who are the most divorced. Uh, I'm missing the parameter. That's, that's, those are years after. Those are years after getting their PhD and they have the divorces. Um, What's the vertical? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what the vertical is. It got lost here. Um, I think those are years after PhD. If I'm taking up your PhD and then the divorce, divorce, divorce rate after that, or maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot what the, what the vertical is on this one. But overall, the curve for women is much higher than it is for, for men. And the, the group that gets the least divorces are the second tier women, the neck, either because they can't afford not, they can't afford to, or maybe their lives are less tense or stressed, or who knows, but that is the pattern. This one I think is very interesting, and the curve here is lost too. The, on the bottom, those are the age group. This is actually from the census. And where you see that tallest green dot, that is 35 and then it goes down after that. So the tallest green dot as women, those are women doctors, it's the rate of reprodu repro reproduction, and then it's lawyers and academic women are the least likely to have children, basically. Now this is in some ways counterintuitive because we know that uh, medical school is endless and difficult and grueling, you have those 80 hours of, of internship and residency, so how do they manage to have so many children? Um, Again, do I never have the answers to these things, but I do ask around, and one of my residence friends said, you know, it's not so bad in the residency because we cooperate, we can take a semester off if we need to, but mostly we don't have to get tenure, we just have to put in our hours. So in some ways, the hardest, most intense part for medical school probably occurs when they're in medical school, not during the residency. And 50% of all babies born to doctors are born while they're residents because they are in their 30s, they're in that make or break decade between 30 and 40, 
when both men and women have to make it in their career, they have to be, get tenure, become a partner, become a, a doctor, or, and they have to reproduce. Certainly women have to reproduce, not necessarily men, as you can see. Um, so women are not, not doing too well in that regard. So the major findings from, again, a slew of studies, I'm just doing it, some of the highlights here, is that only one in three women without children who takes a fast-track university job ever become mothers. A lot of mothers, a lot of mothers actually start with, they come with these. Women who achieve tenure are far more likely than men who achieve tenure to be single 12 years out from the PhD, more than twice as likely. And if married, women are significantly more likely than men to experience divorce or separation. Uh, women faculty were more than twice as likely as men faculty they indicated they wish they could have had more children. Full 38% of women said so in comparison to 18% of men. Um, these, I think, are really worrisome statistics. And I think things are getting better. So when I do this for, um, I've done this for students, graduate students, postdocs. This is when the Kleenex comes out. And I always feel so bad about this because it, it, you know, it sounds so dire and so fatal almost. This is what's going to happen to you. Things are changing and we're doing more things, so you have to wait for good news here as well. Now this is all of you. How many faculty here? How many are faculty here? Okay, how many of you filled out this survey in 2002, the Work Family Survey? You did. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> we actually had a very good response. And, and in San Diego, oh, you were not one of the better. <laughs> Sorry about that. And how did we get this survey? You know the faculty are not, they're not easy to get to do anything that they don't want to do, to say the least. And we also turned as a group. Um, but we got, first of all, this was Atkinson who started in this, uh, when we started our project in 2000. So he sent you all a letter saying how you were privileged to be able to go into this important survey and how important it would be to you and the university. And you know, a real sell job. And of course, we got very poor response. So then we got your chancellors personally to do this. And they told you about the spirit of UCSD and blah, blah, blah. Ooh, a few more. And then we got your deans to do this. So we, we went down the ladder. And then finally, we just sent a little note saying, your paycheck will not arrive on Friday until you, you, you fill up the survey. <laughs> no, we didn't do that, but we, <laughs> we pretty much banged on heads to get this kind of response for faculty. And I'm very proud of it, which is why I put this out here. We actually got 51% from UC faculty who are not known to follow the leaders. So this is, this is really good. We asked all kinds of questions. Oh, is it this one? Everybody is very busy. This is the, um, this is the work this is the second tier, second shift. You can see it very clearly. Women and children put in 26.8 hours uh, on caregiving and 14.3 on housework. And the men, bless their hearts, they put in half of that shift. They put in 15.1 hours on caregiving. And, and use of housework as well. It's not, it's not nothing. Uh, and then you have women without children. You know, at first I thought, what? Who are they caregiving? Their dog? And then, and then I realized that these are women without children, which means it could be women who are older, because the women with children are women who have children under the age of 18 in the household. So it's probably caregiving to perhaps uh, elderly parents, perhaps their husband, perhaps themselves. So that doesn't that, that doesn't that does make sense. Uh, and then they put in they put in just about as much as married you know, the children put in the housework, and then with that children put in the lease, but still some. And the interesting part about this is that. Even though the married women with children have a huge second shift there, they are putting in maybe just about as many hours as men with children. Uh, women without children always work too hard. They work in all these studies. They work harder than anybody else in the university. Shouldn't work so hard. And men without children. So they're all around in, in the 50s. So that's impressive that they put in the time in their work. They don't shirk their work. That means they're probably tired. And this is why people have trouble thinking, how can I do that? Because it looks like it's a difficult shift. I was at the University of Massachusetts, I think it was last week. They had done really a very similar study, and they had something like this. And the interesting part about it there was the numbers of time in professional work were in the 60s, not the 50s. And I thought, you know, is Massachusetts so different? What's going on here? Is it just they don't go out on the weekends, or they don't see the sun? I, I, I was trying to figure it out. And then someone pointed out, well, this study was 2003, and our study was just 2009. And since that time, email has grown gargantuan. So we're putting at least another hour a day in on email. 
answering those students' emails and not figuring out how to say we, we can't do it or won't do it. And I think that's probably true. We now have a third shift, which is the email shift that we put in every day. How many of you think about an hour a day on email? For your students. No, not, by, not for professional work, including your students and your professional work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, okay, and, and in 2003, was it less? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. These are all self-reporting, right? so it could be yes. more. Well, self-reporting is self-reporting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like there, there may be a difference, but in terms of women and men yes. self-reporting. Well, yes. Um, I think there are some sociologists in the audience. What do you think about self-report? It is what it is that people report some things. It seems more socially desirable. So were I a man, I would say yes. Always have to ask for yes, but wouldn't women sort of want to raise their ante too and say, you know, I'm, I'm such a good mother, I put in three hours more than I would do. So, I mean, it goes both ways, but you're right, it does depend on, on what they want. It's well, probably the case that the ratios are constant. Yes. So people, as Kate said, people may be inflating their reports, right. but, but it's not really clear that they would be inflated in, in, in starkly different ways for the Right, and I think the proportions are probably, if you the numbers out, it, was, it would look probably the same if it were actually true. <laughs> and here's the sciences. Again, the scientists tend to think that they are very different and work much harder, but they really don't, at least, at least on the UC system. Um, and they put in the same second tier, and the men put in the same, same, part, same half second tier. Uh, so they, the demographics, again, are surprisingly the same, no matter what part of campus. Obviously, there are many more men here than there are women, but in the end here is huge, and women are, are much less the size. Oh, this is my very favorite slide. You can figure that out. That is, and again, the hours are missing. The hours were something like, uh, I'm sorry that they're missing, 50 hours, and then it goes down to four hours. It's the number of hours spent caretaking. And at 62, we all work the same hours. Something to look forward to. <laughs> See, that's women, women with children up there, putting all that caretaking. But eventually at 62, they're just nestled down there with everybody else, putting in only you know, a couple hours a week. So this is good. I think this is the most hopeful slide of the whole presentation. <laughs> oh, and this, I love this as well. This is the uh, baby leg for women in all fields. The dotted line is your hire date. And then it, it says zero to two years, two to four, four to six years after. You see that men have children early and often. Uh, through the graduate school years, they're much more likely to have children. You have women down there 20 years before. Well, these are the reentry women for the most part. We've had children when they're younger and then go back to school later, the ones at the very end. But then men perk up and they have children early and often and dominate women. And the highest year for women is their tenure year, four to six. And that's, that's classic, wait till you get tenure and have your first child. So in their tenure year itself, a lot of women are pregnant because they, they can't do anything more about it. So when we're waiting for the decision, they, they have, a, have a baby. And then they kind of, they kind of move off pretty quickly because they're already going to be about 40 at that age and they're moving down pretty quickly. Men move down too, but then look at this. What is this? <laughs> 20 years. After being hired, you have a male boomlet, baby boomlet. <laughs> <laughs> How can this be? That's why they don't live as long. Probably too. Now that's that's all fields, and then we have science. Science looks a little different here. The reason it looks different is you've got women really aggressively overtaking men in their tenure year. Look at them shooting up there in that tenure year. That's great. Uh, but then you also have a more aggressive second boomlet there, a 20 year boomlet. Uh, male scientists, it's, more, it's a, large, a larger boom there. So this gives you a pattern of uh, what's happening in terms of childbirth, and men have more children, and they have them more often during the tenure track years, and more often all the time, really, except for that couple of years, of tenure years, that women overpower them in the sciences, not across the field. Uh, and this is the issue of how do you actually change 
policy. Changing policy is easy. You get, well, not easy. Nothing is easy in the UC system. It took us two years to change policy. Went through all the committees of the UC Senate and also the president and the personnel. But it's still the easier part than changing the culture. You can have anything on the book, but it doesn't make any difference if people don't use it. And in fact, there was a previous UC president, Gardner. Anyone remember Gardner, David Gardner? And he was, at the time, incredibly progressive about family policies. They had the first in the nation stop the clock for childbirth. They had the first in the nation active service modified duty. And they were on the book since 1980s. But when we surveyed all of you in, 19, in 2003, we found, first of all, that only half of the people who could have used it even knew that it existed. So 48% didn't know it existed at all. And 51% didn't take it for fear of uh, retribution at the bottom. So, excuse me, for those of, you, those of us who aren't at, uh, working at UC, maybe you can explain ASMD. What is this? Active service modified duty means basically no teaching. That you are uh, for a quarter. For, for a quarter, actually now we've been made it into two semesters and two quarters for those on the quarter system. At the time it was just one quarter, and now it's two. But that, that, is, that is active service modified duty. Um, I keep on missing my little, my little verticals and horizontals here, but uh, basically, that's a people, the policies are, the last one is, didn't know about, oh, no, the last one is, didn't take it for fear of being not serious, basically. And the one, the 46 and 48% is, didn't know about the policy. And the others say, uh, didn't need it, which, which men will say more often than, than, than the women. And uh, I, I forgot who it is. I apologize for these two slides. They seem to have slipped off the slide track. But the idea here is that the best policies in the world are useless unless they're actually known and used. And why aren't they used? Well, they're, they're not used for a number of reasons. Uh, mainly if they're, and this is, we're just talking about this at lunch. Sweden, who we know has the best policies in the world, has 18 months paid family leave. Uh, however, they found that it was the mothers only who were taking it, although both are eligible for it. So they decreed that if a father doesn't take six months of it, that six months is lost. So now fathers are taking uh, parental leave in Sweden. And they're actually taking it in Berkeley, too, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So the new policies you put in are two semesters for active service modified duty, no teaching, one semester for the fathers, two, two semesters for the birth mother. And the guys are really taking this under the law school. They're the only place where we're hiring new faculty. They're all sprouting, having children all the time. Uh, and the, the guys are staying home for their semester and not teaching. They're also taking, everybody's taking the stop the clock. So I, I feel, at least in the law school, the culture has seriously changed. Uh, part of the reason we got it to change is our creating a family-friendly department, chairs and deans toolkit. And every year they have a chair and deeds and chairs retreat and they're put through this. Uh, they have to, I think sometimes they have to take a test on as well. You know how faculty love that. But the idea is that there's no excuse for not knowing what the policy is. We also um, try to make this an incentive. We tell the faculty that if you can tell everybody about our wonderful programs, we're family programs, we'll actually get more young faculty. They'll be interested, and they are. So we can say we have family-friendly policies. We have a uh, little brochure here. We have a faculty concierge who, who walks you through all the policies and other things as well for new, for new faculty. And I do have some proof that this is drawing people. I was sitting at a lecture next to a young man, a new faculty member, and chatting about and he said, we came here because uh, we got two career, two, two positions, that's really great because we don't give too many of them. Um, and then he said, we also were offered that by MIT. And I said, well, why don't you come here? We came here because uh, we hear you have family-friendly policies. So the marketing really paid off. And I think that's what was intended for all the UC systems. And this is written for the UC systems, so you should have your own version. You do have your own version, and that's good. Then we also give it to our graduate students to show them that we have family-friendly policies as well. Um, we have also in place now, 10 o'clock stoppage, the flexible part-time option, which means all of you now, pre and post tenure, can go for a period of time on a part-time basis. That has been approved by the Senate. Um, 
as a pre-tenure person, you could probably take it up to 10 years as a regent's role. So you could presumably come in and be an assistant professor half time for 10 years. Then you would certainly get judged, though, at having at least five years' work, which is the normal time that you come up for tenure. Uh, but you can also take it later in your life, and I think that's very attractive for a lot of people to phase out of retirement for elder care for other reasons. We actually find when looking into it, this that there were a lot of people who were already on this informally, unofficially, and they were largely men in the engineering departments because they were setting up their own company or consulting, and they were already on a half-time basis. So they, were, they had been doing it informally, and now it's, it's actual formal policy for, for all of you. Um, and the school chairs, which I think is a very good idea if you're not doing it. Then we also have, uh, in this school for chairs, we tell people about all the positive things, the fact that it's centrally funded, all of these replacement for teaching is centrally funded by the chancellor, and so is the, uh, um, uh, well, yeah, that's the main thing that's centrally funded here, and all the, 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 the uh, maternity leave is, is, is centrally funded as well. Um, then we also tell them that the, it's the carrot and the stick. I believe in sticks. As a lawyer, I really believe in sticks. So we use these, these scare tactics in a tenure denial lawsuit involving a reported tentative settlement of $495,000, the provost of the University of Oregon told another professor that the mother's decision to stop the clock was a red flag. The department chair also wrote in a memo that she knew as a mother of two infants she had responsibilities that were incompatible with those of a full-time academician. They had to pay $495,000. When I tell this story, I can just tell the guys, holding onto their wallets if they know it would come out of the pocket. Of course, it probably wouldn't, but it's good to know that there are penalties for not, for not really following the laws in this area. And for graduate students, um, since graduate <coughs> students are the ones making the decision often to leave because they don't find it uh, family friendly, we now have paid childbirth leave, which you have here as well. It's only maternity leave, regrettably, but that's what we have. We have expanded infant and, and toddler preschool slots, stop the clock for academic milestones, and we also have very popularly uh, graduate student parent grant, six to eight thousand dollars for graduate student parents who qualify as being poor enough, and they almost all do, for whatever you need it. If you need it for extra expenses or rent or whatever, that is widely used by the law students. I have to say. Ah, and this is my grandma baby pictures. I love this one. Uh, this is from 2003 and then 2009 on the right. In 2003, as you can see, that this is our sister professors and their family configuration. In 2003, 61% of the men had no children for sister professors, and 73% of the women had no children. Um, then, if you fast forward to 2009, after all of our brilliant policies have been put in place, you see that the number of children have doubled for women. Only 36% have no children, and 43% have one child as compared with 15%. And for men, it's improved a great deal too, 41 to 41% and 27%. This, this makes me prouder than anything. I, I think that I was perfectly responsible for all of this. <laughs> yeah, sure. These are not the same people. These are the new assistant professors in 09. Yes, they're not the same people. <laughs> it's new assistant professors each time. No, but there has been a shift. Uh, I think it's partly because the culture has changed. I don't think it's probably just a group that's changing. But it's gratifying to know that these uh, assistant professors feel that they can have children while they're assistant professors. And that was not the case in 2003. This is our, our web page, UC Family Edge, which has all of our research and all of our surveys and the more information that you could possibly want, but a lot of it over the years. And then, of course, that's another, another good word about this book, which has been invaluable as a Christmas present. <laughs> it actually was written for, for younger, because um, it gives, it takes you through the life course and the different, the different issues at each, at each stage, the professional women face, particularly, uh, with a lot of stories about professional women who are, are doing this, including Diane Feinstein and people, graduate students who, who have felt they couldn't go on. So it's a, a wide range of things. Uh, and it's based on our research, and it is based on research. The stories are just to make research less boring, I think. Okay, now this is, um, our current work is on women in STEM fields. And this is a white paper. Uh, and if you're in the STEM fields, I really recommend that you, that you read it. It was published last fall by the Center for American Progress in, uh, in conjunction with our own center, CHEFS. 
Center for American Progress is John Podesta's uh, Washington think tank, and it's, it is considered to be the feeder for the for the Obama White House. That they get a lot of policy ideas from this. And this is a policy white paper, and it's based on four years of our research, in which we searched. Um, all the 13 major federal agencies, NSF, NIH, et cetera, how many of you are funded by NIH? Okay, NSF, here we go, DOE? Yeah. NSF and NIH are the big ones, but we, there, are, there are about 10 others that also give substantial support to universities about what their family policies were. We surveyed all of the AAU universities, at 62, those are the major, 62 major research universities, about what their family policies were. And then, of course, we, we also surveyed all of you, postdocs, all the faculty, and all the PIs. So we had a mound of data to make the case. I want to give you a few shots from this particular uh, white paper. The case here, staying competitive, is basically that for the past 30 years or so, the United States has really tried to develop its own domestic science talent pool because we were very dependent, and still are, for that matter, on international students who may or may not stay here, or who may or may not be allowed to stay here given our immigration arrangements. Uh, and they've been particularly eager to get women into the science, and there's been a lot of effort behind it. As you can see, women have stepped up to the plate. Uh, this is from 1966. Psychology is way up there, 72%. Social science is at 50%, or even a little bit more than 50%. And the biological sciences. How many of you are in the biological sciences here? <clears throat> so you're getting you you really come up to come up to par from a real low down there of 10% in 1966. Even the so-called hard sciences have moved up a lot. Engineering is particularly stubborn, but it's up to 22%. These are a PhD given, just a PhD given, not a faculty member, which, as we will see, is a much much lower percentage. So there's a, there's a really good story here. We're getting people into the pipeline, but we're losing them. Uh, and again, as our earlier data showed, we're losing them before they even take that first job. Um, and it's a great economic loss as well as just a, a, a brain power loss because it costs the federal government probably at least a half a million dollars to educate all of you through your graduate and postdoc experience. At least a half a million, probably more. And it's not money down the drain, of course, you are splendid, wonderful people, but uh, in terms of scientific productivity, it's not really uh, an economically appropriate thing to do. So this is just this, the, uh, the, the uh, chart of the PhDs given. And here's the pipeline again. This is a little different because it's just, just women in sciences. And you see the married women with young children, 37% lower odds than married men with young children to get a tenure track job. Now, the most interesting thing about this is that uh, single women are 30, 33% lower than single women without any children. Single women get that first job in the sciences at pretty much the same rate that men do. They don't have the 37% gap. I think they have a 2% gap or something of that nature. So at that particular point, you're seeing a very strong family formation effect, very strong. Uh, married women without children, 8% lower than, than married men. Um, some, something of a married effect as well, but not so strong. And then at the time of getting tenure, all three groups are not doing too well, including, including for that matter, single women. So achieving tenure seems to be a different phenomenon, but getting into the track in the beginning is where most of the scientists are lost. So that's the reason for putting a lot of effort on graduate students and postdocs, and both making them want to continue on and treating them well if they, if they do have families so that they will continue. Uh, and here we see how well the AU treats graduate students. Um, only 13% of the AUs have paid maternity leave for academic populations of six weeks. That's what you have here now. Uh, and, and we were one of the first to do it, the UC system. And now Princeton and a few others do it in this, in this area. But the shocking part is that 43% have no policy at all for graduate students. Postdoctoral fellows, it's a little bit better, but not much. Academic researchers, a little bit better again. Faculty, pretty good, 
But the, the difficult thing here is you have no policies at all for graduate students in 43% of the cases, and no policies at all for postdocs in 15%. They're just silent on it. And that is, as I call it, it's by the kindness of strangers. It's the, the person in your lab will you know, sort of give you a couple of weeks off, but mutter about it, but there is no set policy on what kind of time can be taken off. And this is for um, parental leave for, for both mother and father, and that's almost non-existent. That graduate student research, that 3% is Princeton. That's only Princeton, because Princeton is so rich, you can do anything that you want. Do you know that it's graduate students actually uh, are given mortgages for, to buy houses in Princeton? <laughs> it almost makes me very upset that Princeton can do whatever they want. Uh, and for faculty, 70%. And that's us. We're down to 17%. We do get parental leave for academic populations. One of the issues here is a Title IX issue. We think of Title IX as being for sports uh, and for discrimination, but it's also for pregnancy and family status discrimination. And the number four D here there is, the recipient shall treat pregnancy, childhood, false pregnancy, termination of pregnancy, and recovery as a justification for a leave of absence without pay for a reasonable period of time at the conclusion of which the employee shall be reinstated. Graduate students and postdocs are not covered by FMLA, so there's no guarantee of a job if they, if they take any time off. And as you found, as we showed you before, 43% of the institutions have no policy of reinstatement. So they are technically out of compliance with, with uh, time of mind. The reason this is interesting is I'm trying to get all of these agencies who never talk to each other, apparently, to work together on common family responsive policies. We have a conference in April, and the head of some of the AU universities, including the president, Bob Bergall, was from the chancellor. That's why I have a project. He was, he's been with me from the beginning. Um, he'll be there, as well as some of the other presidents of universities. to get the agencies and the presidents of these universities to work together on a baseline of family responsive policies with the notion that we are actually losing a lot of talent as well as economic um, economic loss that we're losing them. And you may leave with the other compliance. As I said to you, as, as a lawyer, I think that stick works pretty well as well. We never need to tell them they're breaking the law. Uh, this is what the agencies are doing now. NSF, NIH does the most. They, they really have tried very hard to do various things. Some of the things that are most important are, um, are the um, family, the, the supplements to, to support family accommodations. And NSF and NIH both get them. But the, the difficulty is there's a, there's a legal problem with this. According to circular AMB, OMB, A21, universities have all control over personnel policies. So they determine whether or not you can have supplements or not supplements. And what uh, NSF, what NSF and NIH say, we will give this to the university if they will treat the other classes of researchers in the same way. So that that means pretty much all doctoral students who are working in labs will get them, which means the university will have to kick in. So the university refuse to take this money off it. They don't want to have to be putting in a policy because they can only put it in, they can't put in just select policies for certain groups. They have to put it in for the whole group of postdocs or of academic researchers, whatever. So we, we, they turn away a lot of the money because they haven't figured out how to, how to make it possible. So I'm hoping they're going to work together and do more of that. I carry a lot of that, and I'm talking about this with the, the, the graduate students today. Right now in science, if you leave for a year, I have a student, is the physics student here? Who's in, right, yes, you are. I think you're here. <coughs> no, there's a physics student who said, if I left for a year, I would not ever be able to go back. And I think that is the, the general myth or belief in science that once you're out for a year or more, uh, you're no longer in the running. You're not competitive any longer. Uh, of course, because of family obligation, many people, particularly women, are likely to be out of the out of the loop for sometimes a year, sometimes two, sometimes more. So part of this is to have peer review committees look at that gap in your resume and take into account the fact that it may be a family a family related issue and discount it. The other part is to get postdoc reentry postdocs to uh, women and men who for family reasons have had to be out for longer than a year or so. Otherwise there isn't much of an open door for people to come back, and no one is usually encouraging you. They're saying, you know, too bad you've lost your, you missed your place. So a lot of this has to do with across the life course, not just with parental leave, but finding ways at different times to make it more flexible, 
workplace for both men and women so they can combine it with family balance. So there are a bunch of things on here that they do or don't do. Uh, and, and then again, briefly, these are some of our, our general policy recommendations, which we were discussing them all in Washington. And they're pretty simple. Some of these, some of these are really low-lying uh, fruit, like just giving money for conferences for child care to parents who are going on a conference and need to cover child care. Some agencies do that, some don't. Um, it's, there's, no, there's no real unity about it. Some universities, including our own, had to turn it down because we didn't have a policy on it. It's, just, it's ridiculous. There's such a disconnect and the lack of cooperation between the universities and the agencies. So we're really hoping to make progress, and we pretty much all read this white paper uh, in the spring, to get them to work more together cooperatively to provide uniform policies that are fair and, and useful. And that's all. Thank you.